ladies and gentlemen. Începem să știți, începem. Liniște. I want to ask, no, 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 it's a little bit of a finish. So, in this rainy afternoon, I have to say that I'm very, very pleased to, to welcome to our very modest mission two exceptional academics. And I'm very proud to be able to introduce them to you, uh, especially since I see uh, uh, a rather younger audience uh, who has to be confronted all the time with role models. And these are two of them that I am very proud to introduce to you. Um, everything started with a book that recently uh, was published at the, by the Université de Sorbonne, a book on international doctrines during real comedies in Europe. And um, Professor Motoka and I were discussing about this possibility of having a debate on this because it's actually uh, a doctrine that affected our countries and uh, affected actually the world. We we'll start to. But of course, there are questions that I'm sure will find answers or will be raised uh, during this afternoon. Some of the questions are what have the Marxist internationalists written during the years of real communists in Europe? What was the internationalist relationship with the regimes in force? Uh, accomplices, critics, what were their uh, utopia and illusion? Um, were their attitudes and thoughts different in the East and West? So these are actually some of the questions that this book tries to answer in the retrospect, of course, on the international legal doctrines that have existed in real communism in Europe since 1917 in connection to Marxism that some of us remember even from our own experiences. Well, uh, to raise questions and to give answers, uh, I'm very happy to introduce you Professor Yulia Motok um, and Professor Joseph H. H. Weiler. Professor Yulia Motok is a prominent, I dare to say one of the most prominent Romanian international law professors and she is a professor at the University of Bucharest. Do I remember well the youngest uh, university professor ever in the academic history of Romania? Uh, she is also a judge at the Constitutional Court of Romania. Am I wrong? Isn't she the youngest ever judge at the Constitutional Court of Romania and a member of the United Nations Human Rights Committee? Am I wrong or one of the youngest, if not the youngest? <laughs> She served as UN, uh, UN Human Rights Special Rapporteur for the Democratic Republic of Congo. Our colleagues from the UN environment know what this means, and not only them, what danger that means. And she was also serving as president of the UN Human Rights, UN Human Rights um, Subcommission for this. It was so difficult, both for Professor Botok and for Professor Weiler, to you know, make a short presentation. They both have patience. So for Professor Motok, I, um, uh, we selected um, uh, the books that she published, some of the books that she published, The Democracy in a Unified Europe, uh, Theory of International Relations, The Political and Moral Philosophical Sources, and Plédoyer pour les droits de l'homme. Professor Weiler, of course, Remember, it's... I warned you, my mother is not here. Okay, <laughs> but there are a lot of uh, people who I'm sure are very happy, and I know that they are very happy to see you here, because it's a huge honor for us. And I have to say that you have even a former student of yours. So uh, I know from her that uh, you are very, very much admired by, by, by your students and uh, the academic community. So I'm very... I have to say, and I'm not only polite, I'm really sincere. Some would say I'm not a diplomat. No, I'm saying I am a diplomat, a very happy diplomat who loves to host such uh, prominent academics. And I have to say that little presentation you need with, with your impressive and well-known academic career all over the world. Well, just a few highlights. He serves now as university professor and European Union Jean Monnet chair at the New York University uh, Law School. 
He's also director of the Charles Institute for the Advanced Study of Law and Justice and of the Jean Monnet Center for International and Regional Economic Law and Justice. He had previously numerous appointments, and I uh, will only mention Professor of Law at Michigan Law School and then at Harvard Law School, serving as Manly Hudson Professor of Law and the Jean Monnet Chair. And from all that huge list of publications, um, I could mention the fact that he's the editor-in-chief of the European Journal of International Law and the International Journal of Constitutional Law. He has written a wide range of books out of which the most recent include uh, Une Europa Cristiana, translated into nine languages, The Constitution of Europe, translated in, uh, into seven languages, and the novella, Der, Der Fallsteinmann. Richtig? Great. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have the huge pleasure and honor to introduce you these uh, exceptional personalities that actually I, I will um, kindly ask to start a dialogue, because this is what I understood is the preferred format that you wanted for this afternoon. So I'll leave you the floor. Thank you very much. And it's an honor to be here. I'm certainly a fellow Romanian, wouldn't you say? Yes. And I'm also a long-standing friend and admirer of Yuri Moto. What I want to do in this conversation is to weave together some things about your life, but also to discuss the book and the themes in it. And maybe my first question is, when you say international doctrines during the years of real communism, can you say a few words about this real communism? What's the unreal communism and what's the real communism? Yes, and um, thank you very much. I also I am very honored to be here and uh, very grateful to, to the Ambassador University to organize this event and for Professor to, to come with his schedule. So when I have to, to, I have a question because I had also a question regarding this, this title as well. So we started this project uh, with Emmanuel Joanne, uh, maybe four years ago, uh, and uh, it's more than four years ago, four years and a half ago. And uh, I have this idea to do to do a project about uh, international law during communism in Eastern country because there were a lot of writings about uh, Marxism and uh, not f f making the connection with, with the experience of uh, of communism. So I had this idea for a long time to have this uh, do this book done to see exactly which is in practice the relationship between the, the Marxist and uh, the, the, the application of the Marxist in this country, if it's a relationship between the two of them. And uh, I have spoken with, uh, with Emmanuel. And of course, there were, uh, at the beginning, there were some reticences, you know, regarding the topic of the book. And you should not be so, uh, uh, not for, for Emmanuel, but for the others. And uh, because most, as, as you know very well, most of the most of the doctrine is, is still uh, even now more favorable to a leftist at least approach to, to international law. Say they will not really dare to speak uh, very open about uh, the relationship between the Marxist and the experience of the Marxism in this uh, eastern eastern countries. This is the reason we took a kind of milieu approach. So uh, we say from the beginning that it's not, this is not the, the black book of, uh, of communism. It's nothing that uh, we assume to do, but it's, uh, it's something about the doctrine and what happened in uh, what happened really in this country. So I, we speak about this kind of Marxist, uh, Marxist Leninism apply in, uh, in Eastern Europe. So this was the only way that uh, we find really um, we find a name for uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, phenomena. So tell me if I understand correctly. So you say it's quite widespread in the West to have Marxist international laws, even more so in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Now they don't call themselves Marxists, they say Gramscian. It's a bit more 
possible. When you say real communism, you say, so you're interested not in Marxist theory of international law, but actually the practice of international law in realized Marxist in actual communist countries. It's a kind of reality check in, in that respect. So I said uh, I wanted to weave the personal with uh, intellectual and professional. Your career as a young woman, you were still under Chelchester. And I think your first job as a judge was still under that regime. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Not only what you did, but what you carry with you from that period. Because one of the amazing things about this book is you will agree with me, because I think everybody here is uh, European. I don't think Americans have much interest in this kind of stuff. But, uh, I think they have a growing interest. Uh, I mean, it's some back room of the CIA. But, <laughs> but, but you will agree with me that in Europe today there's a kind of amnesia. We just want to forget it, move on, not talk about it. So there's something really audacious in bringing out this book which combats that amnesia. So I, I really would like to hear a few minutes about your personal experience, not just what you did, but what. What, what do you carry with you for that period? Yeah, this is very, it is indeed a very complicated story, but of course you carry, you carry something. And um, I have to did. say, I have to say, I have to say why I had this idea, because after, it's, it's true that uh, I graduated the School of Law during communism and they were the worst years of communism. So this is the reason I keep repeating in my country, even at unpopular in my country that we don't have a doctrine of public law in Romania yet and we don't have a human rights doctrine yet because uh, this year were dominated by the co co propaganda, the communist propaganda and we made a difference in the book between the Diyama, what we call the Diyama, the Marxist-Leninism which is just an empty propaganda and what was the Marxist as such because it's, it's a big distance between the two of them. So what I, what I carry is that, uh, and as you said, I graduated school of law during communism. Also the high school I have done during bad years of communism where there were very few theoretical high school, of course, I have to experience to, to as I think some of my colleagues here and, and an ambassador as well for sure, we have to experience years where uh, we are not going only to the most uh, theoretical school but also we have to do agricultural practices and facing, I remember in the school of law we were with the Japanese at the same class, so there were unbelievable way of doing things from the western perspective. And, uh, yes. And military training in data. And, uh, our kind of work out. Our kind mm -hmm. of work, yes. yes. If we can say, say this. But it's, uh, so afterwards, uh, of course, in, uh, I graduated in 1989, so we were the last generation graduating the school, uh, the school of law. And uh, I was still the youngest, because if you start to be the youngest, you are not going to finish with the youngest career. This is sure for me. <laughs> so, you have to prepare yourself. Yeah. reach a point, you're not going to be the youngest. <laughs> I know from personal experience, it's painful. <laughs> I didn't reach the stage yet. I, I don't know. I'm, so wondering, I'm going to prepare, but I don't, I'm, not, I'm wondering when I'm going to, prepare, to, to reach this stage. But uh, at, the, at the time, in 1989, I graduated and I became a prosecutor, so worth it, a judge. Uh, because it's and why I choose to become a prosecutor? It was because that du during uh, com real communism we do didn't have much much choice because the state it was the last year of the communism so the state obliged us to work in certain place to stay there so it it was um, uh, an, uh, a thing that I have done for if you want to practical reasons more that, uh, and because I wanted to be to be a magistrate, but there were very few places for, for magistrates in 1899, but it was something that was done by, by the state. So I was a prosecutor at 60 kilometers far for Bucharest. And here it's but only for four months during communism. Uh, but I don't think that this was really my main experience with, uh, with communist regime and law. 
I think that my main experience with communist uh, regime and law came after, because I, afterwards I, I started to uh, study in France in 1990, so very, very early after the fall of the communism. So I could compare things, so I start to think about what happened before, about you know it's uh, it's uh, what 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 Western countries, what happened in Eastern countries, and uh, I discovered the differences. And for these differences, you know, I start to understand. And when I return to Romania, I start to be very interested by this theme, you know, which is which is not yet done because it's also the political philosophy who is lacking to have a definition of uh, of communism. No, it's it's a big it's something that is lacking in the political philosophy. The political philosophy is still more interested with the history, with the, the end interpretation of Aristotle or the end interpretation of uh, of Kant or Plato. But they are not yet interested to say to see what happened with this totalitarian phenomena, which was a big thing for the for the last century. So we, we, we have almost nothing about this thing. Also, the history is too recent, but uh, there, really there are very few things written. And uh, I was I was trying to, to come back to the thing, so when I returned to Romania, and I just, you know, discovered, because they were the year of post-communism, the, the, and you see more the regime, I think, in post-communism, because what I had considered all the time, it is that the post-communism was a continuation of communism, so we see the same features. So I tried to understand why the regime the communist regime uh, was there, where, where were the basis of their legitimacy. And, and this was one of my main, my main intellectual concern. And one of the, the, the main legitimacy bases that people are not really speaking is the cultural basis of communism. So you see very much, and here, in, and this is my experience in Romania as well, we see very much they were educating among books, educating in li libraries, but the reason why the culture was so much promoting and the reason why uh, it was more an, an aesthetical approach and not an ethical approach, the reason why I, I made all the time the same reference, you see in 1988 in Romania, Heidegger translated in 15 exemplaries, 1,000 exemplaries, so it's, it's enormous quantity for Heidegger, who is going to read this Heidegger? And you know, in the, uh, near the uh, airplane, near the airport of Romania, in, uh, in the early 90s, and even now, you find books of philosophy. Who is going to buy a book of philosophy and travel with, with an airplane? Normally, you find only this kind of very, very easy literature. But, but, but was that, but at that time, mm -hmm. were people buying and reading? Of course. There were a lot of people buying because it was not only people were, were saying, and I gave the example of our famous philosopher Konstantin Noika, who had also a counterpart but very different in Czech Republic, Jan Patochka. So people they believe really that they can they can save each other by country, by by, by culture. This was the this was the the, the way that they, they it was the philosophy it, they, they, they have, it was something that was inoculated to people and it's not, uh, uh, it's not by chance Heidegger was, was also bought in this, in this. There were no Heidegger on the market. One Heidegger was, was translated, I remember nobody could find his book because people tried to read it at the time, you know. Everybody tried to, tried to read this book. So even now with it, we have this, this debate, if you want, you know, now I pass a little bit for my own, and my own experience is the following, because when I arrived in France, I was, uh, uh, at the time I was 22 years old, and I, I thought, you know, every, all these French people around me were, all lack, were lacking of culture comparing with us, and afterwards, I, I, at a certain moment, I went to, to study literature, and I went to, 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 to the School of Literature in France, and there, I had the same impression, you know, that us in Romania, we knew more. It, it was obvious because even my colleagues told me, you know, more French literature than that that us. You are a genius. I said, no, I'm a normal Romanian who reads literature. It's nothing special about this. I remember that I have written all the books of Stendhal, and none of my colleagues had done only one or two uh, or books at, at the moment. So, so it was a big difference between because it was what we had done during college, what it was inoculated to us, and what what some people still believe that it was a form of resistance to, to communism. I don't believe this. But there are some intellectuals, they still believe that this was a kind of protest to communism. I think that this was a way that aesthetic was privileged in, in and ethics protest was not encouraged, and it was in, in Czech Republic. 
So it's, it's a kind of experience you, you want to, that, that I have with this kind of society on one side. On the other side, I think when I returned to Romania, what I understood in early 90s, because I returned to my to my job of, of being a judge, because afterwards in the early 90s I became a judge at Bucharest, afterwards I start to understand another another problem that communists had a corruption problem. And this was this was staying with me all the time and now and all my it is a is another kind of um, uh, intellectual uh, intellectual preoccupation that I have in all my activities afterwards. But this started with my own experience, both of them. You know, it's uh, studying the, 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 the relationship between ethics and aesthetics, studying totalitarian regime. Um, also, I think, you know, it's um, also co the corruption thing. And also, I think very much, you know, the, the defense of human rights that we didn't have in Romania. And I don't think we have enough even now. So let's, let's do an inventory because you said two or three very provocative things. So the first thing you said, although it was communism, etc., etc., in terms of culture, you said it was an attempt to aestheticize the situation, but nonetheless the end result was that people were very cultured. In my own personal experience, I remember I went to teach in Eastern Europe in the early 90s, and I wrote back to my colleagues at Harvard and said these were the best students I've ever had anywhere, because they were deeply cultured and very interested in learning. When I go now and teach in Eastern Europe, they like Western Europe. They're in my discipline in law, they're interested in making money. If I give a course even on human rights, they don't take it. If I give a course on discriminatory tax or international trade, I have 150 students. So it's a complicated statement you're making because on the one hand it's a critique, on the other hand it's a lament. We've lost something. And then the second provocative statement you made, you said even though there was a, a transition from communism to post-communism, in some deep sense nothing changed. I just want to ask you, can you say two or three more words about that? When you say, even though it was post-communism, it wasn't a fundamental change. What do you mean by that? Because again, that's a very interesting and provocative thing. Yeah, this is, but both, both of them, they are, they are debates, they are huge debates, and uh, with, uh, with uh, a lot of people that had, uh, had debated this. And uh, of course, uh, when I, we had, and we had, uh, uh, the moment of the fall of the communism had uh, difficulties to be named because most of them they had uh, at a certain moment they were named as as a revolution, you know. And of course that it's very difficult to have this uh, this name for this for this moment or for this uh, for this momentum. But uh, we don't have an unanimity. For me, it's clear that it was not a transformation of the regime. So I take very much what François Furet had said about this moment. We don't see a transformation of the regime because it's, we don't cannot have a revolution because it's new, not a new regime that come. It's a return to a regime, a political regime that it, it existed in, in, in practice in elsewhere and existed even in our country. So we don't have a new regime that came and this is the reason we don't have What do you the, mean when you say it's not a new regime? Because it's the same people? Because no, it's the same political regime. It's a, it's a political regime that that you know which was established in Western countries. It's not like the French Revolution, who is going to establish another philosophy, political philosophy in practice. In in this sense, it's new, a new regime. As it was the ancien and the, the ancien regime in France that changed with uh, with uh, uh, the, the uh, revolution. So this in this kind of thinking of a revolution that François Furet had. I think that it's just so not I, to change. So I, I'm the dumb one. So, but at some level, it's totally different. If I look at Romanian politics now, you have a new president or prime minister every year. There's contestation, there's opposition, and government, and it changes. And it looks as if people are, in some deep sense, enjoying politics because of this. Whereas before, you had a authoritarian, dictatorial regime with the same person in power. Another difference is every regime has secret services, but people in Romania do not have the same fear that they had 
when they were living under Ceausescu. So these seem to be very fundamental, and you have a free press. You don't get chucked in prison if you say the president's things. I was myself in Romania just a few months ago, and there was street protest, and I was impressed by the restraint of the police. I was impressed by the restraint of the police. So these seem to be pretty fundamental changes. In other words, to say that it remained the same at some deep level, you mean it remained the same, because at least outwardly, nobody is going to claim that uh, Romanian democracy now is perfect, which democracy is perfect, and we have a problem of corruption. <coughs> Maybe get to that in a minute. But I, I need still to understand the sense in which you mean that it remained the same. It's here we have, I think, two levels. And so we have the theoretical levels, and we have, which is not the political theory level. And uh, we have also the practice level. And I think you know that what, uh, how the history of Marxism started, and Kolakowski had this, this idea, but it's not a very diff diff difficult one. When he started the history of Marxism, he said, the political philosophy cannot look at the reality. It's different, cannot, cannot look so much at the reality. It has to do the history of ideas. So what I said is more in the in the political philosophical sense, and not of course in the, in the reality same thing. Because if we look to the experience, of course it was it, it, there were a lot of progress in human rights. There, there, as you said, you know, it's a democratic regime. But what we said also is that when where the communists came in Romania in, for, in 1944, we had only 1,000 communists in Romania. It was something a regime that was brought. From, from outside, and we had a kind of starting of democracy. We have a parliamentary regime in Romania during this time. So in this sense, and I think all the Eastern countries, most of the Eastern European countries, so in this sense we said that it's a return for us, you know, it's nothing that is new. Because we return to what we had said, which we just, we just started in the in the 30s, in, uh, in practical, that we had, a, and we have, uh, and we just lost it because, you know, it was a regime which was imposed so, from so abroad. The, the continuity, you mean, was the pre, between the pre-communist and the post-communist. The continuity was, was like this, but if you see, I think, you know, that every regime has his lasting, you know, at least in the 90s. And in my view, what happened is that it's, uh, it's the process of democratization of Eastern country. Here it's a huge discussion. Of course, was done very much by by the European Union, and uh, the, the criteria that you see a lot of progress. And in, even in the early 90s, we have people saying that if we didn't have Eastern Europe, and now it's another provocative, I think, idea. If we don't have European Union, Eastern Europe will become a kind of Latin America. So we have uh, 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 Przewodniczący saying this in 1990. It's clear that only European Union uh, can, can, only Europe can make this Eastern Europe not to become Latin America. And we see that, of course, the democratization in Eastern country were done very much by the Copenhagen criteria, but but everything what was what was imposed. And here it's a, another uh, huge huge discussion. But it was a very was 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 in practice one of the most rapid one in in, in transitional theory. And uh, it's but still you know you see at the last again why I speak about the rule of law because I think that the rule of law not only in Romania, because I don't make a distinction between Romania and other countries. I don't think that we are an exceptional country in Eastern Europe. I don't make the separation between Bulgaria and Romania, and I don't believe that we have a central central Europe. Central Europe. I think that we have this in culture, but in reality, I think the regime were the same. And I think that the rule of law was very weak, and uh, was very weak in communist Romania as it was in other Eastern Europe. The rule of law was very weak at the end of the communism, and what we said, what, what we say, and this I, 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 I understood immediately, is that, this, that uh, in the early 90s, where nobody had understood this, that among these criteria, where I have read, read, read the Copenhagen criteria in France, I understood that they don't have the rule of law. And because they had only the, the looking at the election, they are looking to minorities much, but they don't look to something which was fundamental, how the justice is functioning and how the rule of law is functioning. And in this sense, I think that the situation in Eastern, Eastern Europe in general had 
a little bit the, the situation of the judiciary was not enough and the rule of law in general was not enough taking taking into into account so in this we see that how this <coughs> it's a continuation and uh, maybe mm -hmm. i have to answer to the first uh, first question that both of them they are huge let's in the culture yeah let's, let's move on a little bit mm -hmm. so i want to ask two things so before we started I was speaking to the ambassador, and she told me something that struck me. I, I never realized that. But I reached the age where I don't have to apologize for my ignorance. That's one of the advantages of getting old. So she said that under the communist regime, there were no female ambassadors. One. I said no female diplomats. Diplomats. Even more sweeping. Even more sweeping. One token, and then females were secretaries in the mission, but never diplomats. And now she told me that maybe 55% of the functionnaires, we're not talking about secretaries, of the functionnaires of the foreign ministry say are Romanian. So in this respect, there's been a huge change. And you yourself, have, you judge on the constitutional court, and you, you represented your country in, in so many important fora. So in the situation of women, it seems has changed dramatically. Yeah, this is another complicated, complicated story. Topic of debate. A topic of the uh, whole debate, because in, in, uh, in the theory, the, the situation of uh, the human rights in, uh, in uh, Eastern country were, was very much uh, uh, protected, but in practice it was still the tradition. Because what happened is that what is recognized is that that communist regime didn't stay as a democracy. Uh, it, it, st it stopped in the late 60s. So this is the reason why nobody believed anymore in communism at the late 60s. So this is the reason why the regime was looking for new basis of legitimacy. This I, I call that culturalism, nationalism, and you know that it's the kind of, of consumerism where the free basis, the new basis of the legitimacy of the communist regime after the 60s. And it's um, what I think about women rights as well is it's because what happened is that the traditional, because these rights were not believed fully, this this traditional role of women, it was still there in the society. So it was a mixture between women who were who were there. But for instance, in the school of law, when I was during communism, 90% we were women. But this was the reason maybe why the judiciary was a weak. You know, the phenomena where where you see very you know where you see a lot of women. You have to even now, you know, you have to put this question: Is this part of the the is this part of the world? Very, become very weak, or it's something because I also have the experience. I work not only that I was the youngest, but I work with men all the time, and I have a committee that I left now, the minority committee, and I see that only women were a lot of women were around me. So I see when I, a lot of women are around me, I have to leave because I all my life I had worked only with uh, when young, a little bit young people come younger than me, I have to leave. This is not, it's not my place anymore. But this is the how life is doing. doing how my life is, to do, is going gone. So when I have seen this woman and young, uh, two younger people, it's, of course it was the moment that I leave the committee. So this is the reason why I see this woman, because the committee is not so important anymore. This is the sign as well. You put women in places and you understand that this place is not very important for the state. I think the judiciary, of course, was not important for the state. And obviously this is the reason why we could have 90% of my generation were women, you know, and it's uh, it's uh, and here we have the the complicated discussion. I think you know diplomats to put it very diplomatically, they had more complex roles than the judges had at the time, and this is the reason women were not sent at uh, at, at at the time as diplomats. But I know for sure that generally speaking, I think you know it's um, it's also you know. It's, 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 as feminist theory recognizes, it's also back and forth. You know the, the rights of women. You know you never you never know where where this this will disappear. But I think you know that also you can see that it was a sign of, of weakness because we were at the school of law. But of course that after the fall of the communism, uh, we started to have uh, everybody started to have new new chances and also this kind of 
traditional thinking, the traditional thinking about the role of the women became a little bit different because in my view at least we don't have enough you know gender uh, gender study we don't have even ideas because everything starts with ideas i think that the first gender program at the university of Bucharest was established only last year so this is something it is the main university in the country we had visited and the biggest one and we have a gender program established after 20 years of the after the fall of the communism the first one and it's in french by the way the program so, so now if you look at uh, Eastern Europe as a whole, as you said. So not a focus on Romania. Is, do you detect there's still some kind of identity that differentiates it from Western Europe? And in particular, so when you talked about the weakness in the rule of law, and that's the usual image in the West, in Western Europe, that those Easterners have to catch up. So we see a microcosm of that in Germany itself, even 25 years after unification, it's still uh, Ossis and Vessis and these resemblance. And then the same thing plays in a macro, the whole of Europe, there's Western Europe, and it's, it's a narrative of they have to catch up. The rule of law is not so good and the economy is not so good, blah, blah, blah. But what I'm interested in, what you were saying before, if A, can you articulate an identity contemporary which is still Eastern Europe, and also features of it which are not catching up with the West, but which maybe the West should catch up with them. You know, the, what is the unique contribution of that distinct identity if you think one still exists? Yeah. Now again, this is something that uh, that I, I remember very I remember very well because it's uh, what I have to catch up and. Uh, I don't believe in this catch-up theory. I think that uh, for, for practical political purposes, the catch-up theory, I think it's a, it's kind of a, kind of empty theory. And why why I believe this? I believe this because uh, I don't separate so much the two spaces. You know, we don't have we don't have now, as you said before, you know, the new students in uh, in Eastern Europe they look exactly like the Western students. I don't think. On the other side, we see a lot of uh, of islands or non rule of law here and everywhere. I think this is another very interesting thing that we don't have enough re reflection even in the philosophy of law. And you know very well because you have you have at NYU this this uh, this uh, you had by yourself, with Professor Kinsberg, you had this debate about international law. But on the other side, you had a sem seminar of philosophy of law, and I was looking, you know, in this. In this uh, work in the night, and I was looking all the time to somebody to 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 have some something related to what you know became the rule of law. And we see maybe something you know in the Teubner theory about this and the, the the what what the law started to be. So in this in this in contemporary in term, not in only in history. This is the reason I don't believe in the in the catch-up theory very much. And uh, regarding uh, regarding the identity. I think it's uh, it's very it's very difficult to say that it's it's again again it's very fragmented. I think that maybe still for my more more my generation we have an identity. So I can recognize now we are I was at the, I, I was working at an agency against discrimination. So I have seen one of my colleague in Slovenia. He, he is younger than me, and we realize that of course he's the first one who raised to me this question. No, we still have the identity. The, and this identity, as you said, it is given by culture. You know, again I start, I, I came back there, and I came back to the other thing that I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't spoke before, because as you said, this has the, as you, as you, as you see all these dilemmas when you analyze the philosopher as a Heidegger, because you see all these dilemmas about the human being, about the economic transformation, all this alienation theory that was 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 tackled by, by Heidegger after the after his polit political philosophy that he incorporated with him. But you see all this dilemma there, what you are going to choose in order to have still, you know, the, the being, what you, what you are going to, to do. And uh, even if in, in Eastern countries this was an option that may, maybe in Romania,
Romania was more, more, uh, less ethic than aesthetical than it was in Czech Republic with the Charter 77 where Patochka changed a little bit this whole philosophy of Heidegger into an ethical, into an ethical movement. Even if this was, uh, it was like this in Eastern country, we still have this identity. We still have our generation this identity, and I think maybe in this way, you know, it it is, it was, it is still because we we are still at the, uh, we are still there. It's something that they could catch up with us. I don't know if if, if we speak about if we speak, speak about catch up, but it's, I don't think in catch up. I think they can interact with us because. They have to learn this for us, you know. Well, I'm pessimist because it's not a question of them catching up with you. It might be a question of you falling Easy. down, mm -hmm. falling down to them. You know, your standards dropping. And that's been my experience as a teacher. Can we? Do you mind if we come a little bit closer to the book? So, in the book, you you draw a big distinction, and it's reflected in the structure of the book. You compare the conception, the doctrines of international law in the West. That's one part of the book, and the doctrine of international law in the East were actually the communist regimes. Could you maybe in two or three minutes tell us the, the biggest difference? How, since the book is divided into this, so it, it means it's an, a, a relevant <coughs> distinction, so how would you define the difference between the doctrines, communist doctrines, as developed in the West? and communist doctrines developed in the East. What's the big difference? Where, how would you articulate that? There, 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 are, uh, there are big differences. And uh, it's, uh, as you had, as you had uh, seen in the book, it's, uh, what we have in, uh, in, uh, East, in Western countries, it's a kind of uh, an international law, and because it's very difficult to conciliate the, the pure Marxist theory, because it's an, as you as you know very well, it's a non-state theory. So this is the big dilemma of the international law: what to do with a theory that that postulates the non-state and how to to apply it. And and uh, as uh, as people characterize the example, for example, Charles Chamon in France and uh, Ecole de Reims, it was more it was more a militantism that it was inspired, you know, by it was an analysis inspired by the by the, the, the Marxist, but it was not not anymore the idea of revolution. And this distinction is very well done. It's very well done in political philosophy between the the Marxist and you know what you call the the, the new Marxist theory, like you know at at, uh, at the time you know as you speak about Marcuse and all the Frankfurt uh, School and all this all the theory that they have. So this distinction, it's, uh, it's, it's made in political philosophy. And it's the distinction between the Marxist of, uh, of even the political party who were Marxist in, uh, in Western country, they, 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 they gave up to the idea of, uh, of a revolution and they passed, at least at the late 60s, they passed to the idea of a pacific revolution, so to, to, to a communist regime. So we see that it's a, the, the communism, of course, in Western country was a Euro communism, you now as is this name, was different comparing to uh, the, 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 what happened in Eastern, in, in, in doctrines in Eastern country. What happened in doctrines in Eastern country, because Marxism not was nowhere at the end of the day. This is uh, the paradox. Pure Marxism was nowhere, or Marxism, even Marxism was not there. Because at, at it is too. Because in in uh, in Western countries we see this kind of no Marxist theory. They have no without, without a revolution. And in in Eastern country, what we see it's less that a Marxist Leninism. We see a kind of empty kind of empty propaganda that I I I. I have but how is it reflected in? Can you actually mm -hmm. give us? A is it possible to give a concrete example from some doctrine of international law mm -hmm. that you would say in the West this is how they talked about it and in the East this is how they talked about it? So that we could really feel this difference in yeah. relation to a doctrine of international law. And yet both claiming to be Marxist. Yeah, I, th I think that the differences are uh, uh, the differences are in, uh, in what what they have in, I'll start what they have in common very much. Of course, they had in common uh, kind of approach to economic, social, and cultural rights in the 60s that was was very much uh, in common of, of two. And uh, what they have in common is the analysis of the power structure. So it's 
the power, the infrastructure, how the power it works, how the, so the, the, the concrete analysis of the society. That is, it was very much Marxist. But uh, this was, if you want, in my view at least, if I have to read uh, Chamon or other 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 Marxists, you know, at, at the time, at, uh, at his school, basically, or other other Euro international law, I see I see the difference between between him because it's more something that it's a kind of militantism, and in Eastern country the doctrine became very severe. For instance. They, they said all the time that the state, that the, the, not Jean Baudin, for instance, uh, uh, in, in Latvia, there were, there were authors, and in Lithuania, there were authors who <coughs> stated that you know, it was Estonia, were not, were not uh, the, 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 not, it was not the, the Jean Baudin who invented, but you no, know, there were some counselor of the Ivan uh, the Fourth who had invented, in fact, the, the idea of state. So we see this kind of very primitive, uh, um, protagonism that we have. Everything started with us that replaced and they became very nationalist and this is one feature, if you want, of the theory of state. We see on the other side, if you want, in a more evaluated, because we have to make a distinction between some very dis more respectful, if I think, international lawyers as maybe Bashukanis or afterwards Tunkin and the late generation. The late generation were only Diamant and, and the, the, the pure propaganda. So, you know, if you want, in the most evaluated, uh, the most evaluated international lawyer, as Tunkin, we see that for him, uh, the as, as sources of international law, the, the principle, the general principle of law, they were not considered to be as we consider in in West the the principle of Western countries, the the, the, the most civilized nation, because of course they don't like this expression. But not only this, but this <coughs> principle were for for them. The principle adopted in 1970s at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at the General Assembly. So it's a completely different different vision about this, this principle that they have in West. Of course, it's uh, also the, the custom, they had a different interpretation. As you know, they were more oriented to the treaties than to, to custom and the other sources of law. So we see in this that the others, even if they are critical, they are not saying that these sources doesn't exist. They don't replace the general principle. They just criticize, and they want them to be to be to to, to have to have establish something. Of course, what they have also in common, and here it's another big discussion. It's what happened in the third world at the time, and colonialism and post-colonialism. And here, it's still a, a way where we see the, the the masses of today. You know that they concentrate a lot. I think it would be a good time now to open the floor for other people to ask you their microphone questions or make comments on what she said. Um, actually, thank you very much for understanding the spirit because I really think that there were a few provocative uh, thoughts that were expressed here. And uh, having given you the modesty of Professor Weiler, I would encourage you, my dear colleagues, to ask questions also to Professor Weiler. Uh, because, of course, he just withdrew, uh, you know, in the shadow of our um, main speaker. But I would love you to take a profit of this occasion, too. If you want, of course. If not, we will continue this conversation. Um, but I really, I really appreciate the fact that you give to our audience the uh, possibility to express their, I don't know, comments or to ask some questions. Especially because there are a few colleagues of ours who are from that very different corners of the world and we're very curious to see uh, yeah. if uh, how they process all this no. i don't think that should also they are the most welcome to put questions for this yes please thank you very much for organizing this event which is uh, uh, really refreshing in salvatore zapala from the uh, I have actually two questions for which uh, I think are also curiosities in a way. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the, the, you referred to a rule of law which was very weak uh, under the communist regime, but was also the role of law very weak. Uh, the role of law both at domestic level, uh, law as an instrument, if you want, in a, in a, 
maybe even in a sense which can be uh, uh, negative, but can, you know, can be used as an instrument. And also at the international level, in the relationship with uh, the other side of the world or uh, other states. And uh, the other uh, question relates to the uh, comment you made about the analysis of power. Do you think there still uh, is uh, some value in the analysis of power which was uh, uh, embodied in the uh, communist doctrines of international, uh, lower international relations? It's, uh, thank you very much for, for the questions. I rem the, f the first question, I remember, uh, because you know we have this discussion in, uh, in as a very, we start with a very common sense discussion. You know, we have, a, we have in, in, in Romanian a famous book written by, by Alexander Valero, the common sense as a paradox that was very much read during comments and speaking with uh, about books. And uh, uh, I remember when I made the first, uh, we we had published in uh, in I think uh, 1996 in Romania, 1997 we had published in Romania a new edition of the manifesto of uh, of the, the Communist Party with my colleagues. And uh, I have written to this new edition because we had commented the manifesto. And at this at this stage. You know, I found something very not not only which was the place of law in the Marxist theory that you know very well that law is considered that a superstructure that not, doesn't have the same value as the others the, the same value that the other that the other structures. You know, they have it's a separate superstructure. But also, I had discovered something very interesting regarding Marx himself, why? Right? Because I have read I have read. The, the, the letters that uh, Marx had uh, had uh, written to his father was he was, was he was studying studying law because you know very well that Marx was studying law. So, so he said he was so unhappy to study to studying law himself because he wanted to start literature. He said I, I, all my life I wanted to 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 to, to study poetry, you know. And now I am just with this with this very arid law. What I am going to do? So we see that Marx himself he hates law, and maybe it's a, it's a, it's not only his analysis to power, but it's his in, his individual way, his own life that always you know shape a mind of a philosopher. We see this as a lot of people, this poor uh, uh, young Marx, the going to the school of law and wanting to study poetry. And I think you know this this uh, instead of law. And I think you know we see very much even in the Marxist doctrine that law is a superstructure. So here my answer will be yes from an end to another because it's the Marxist theory as such, the pure Marxist theory, you know, what you can be uh, something more concentrated than that. You see in the capital, we see everywhere, you know, uh, these this, this, uh, this theories about the rule of the law, but uh, the, the, it's, the super, it's very well known. But afterwards, you, you see in practice as well. Why? Because it's you see in practice, because uh, the communist state uh, cannot cannot control anymore. It's the it's the rule of every totalitarian state, you know. Yeah, because you, you see, you know, Arendt had made this statement very much, and I think she was very much right. Use totalitarian law, they are they, they cannot control until then. They start to lose control, and you see the communist communist state in the 60s. 70s started to lose control. This is the reason why, on the economic side, you see new incipient way of capitalism, you know, and the, I say consumerism because the planified economy doesn't exist anymore. You see some form of kind of that is not respected anymore. It exists but it's not respected, and, it, and this is the reason why the rule of law was not cannot cannot be strong in a totalitarian regime. Aaron was saying this very 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 clearly because. A totalitarian state cannot control until then. It cannot control things, and, and it, it, it became it became a weak state. And if you and this is the paradox of this totalitarianism. If you want a long distance, and as it was the communism, you know. And even here we have different classification because there are some 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 uh, uh, some political scientists say that it was more authoritarian regime after the 60s and not totalitarian. But anyway, this kind of state cannot control. So this is the reason why rule of law is weak. Speaking about international law here, I think that uh, international law very much transformed for Marxist theory. You know very much because you know, it's a it's a, it's a denial as as this was the dilemmas of Marxist internet what to do because it's 
you have you have to abolish the state. So they have to to very much to to, to adopt the Leninist uh, and to accept the state. This was the first step that was done by by Bashukanis and by Dallas in the twenties regarding the theory of uh, of Marxists. They, they were real Marxists because afterwards they became very much integrated. So it's uh, I think you know that international law became very much simplified. And when I had spoken about uh, about Tukin here, I think he was the main he was the main philosopher. He had courses at the he, the, the main uh, international law at the world now. He had courses at the Hague. And still, you know, we we seen some uh, manuals of uh, even contemporary one in Eastern countries. Here's the the theory of Tukin. And I think it was a quite quite rigid one. You know, it became a little bit more.